This time on Graveyard Cars, work begins on Goldberg 68 GTX and Will paints the one of 17 67 Hemi GTX. It all leads to an epic painting showdown when Will and Mark face off on this episode of Graveyard Cars. In case you missed it last time, we covered the entire history of the build on the 1970 340 Cuda. We even pondered the question, was the engine sabotaged? While the jury is still out on that, at the end of the day, we delivered one of the most epic little 340 Tour Red Cudas that's ever been at Graveyard Cars. Moving along pretty good here in the shop. I got a car to add here. It's our Challenger. I'm a little late getting this added up there. Uh, JS23 Victor Zero Bravo. Zero means it was 1970. B means Hamtramck, Michigan. V is a 446 pack. So we're gonna go 446 pack. Four speed. It's an A33 car. That gives us the 354 Dana. And it is a V1W, which is our white top and no stripe. That's what it looked like when it came in. It was pretty tattered. It has the original numbers matching 440 and four speed in it. All right, we're moving along good on this car. We've got the body and paint done. It was a nice car. Frame rail wise, doors are original, fenders are original, hoods are original on it. Just the back half sheet metal. We've got the quarter panels, uh, trunk floor, trunk floor extensions, one apron up here in the front, Dutchman panel. Uh, rear body panel had to be replaced on it, but now we started assembling it here. That's where that one's at, and, uh, and it's moving. It's moving right through the shop. It's exciting to see this car done. With our six-pack Challenger loaded up on the progress board, it's now time to start working on the classic pistol grip shifter and four-speed linkage. This is the original Hearst Competition Plus shifter box that the car started life with. It's not a reproduction, which they do make. This is the original that I sent to Brewer's Performance. They do a phenomenal job. Every single component Every lever, every arm, every torsion spring, everything in this thing is new and not just clear coated or, or satin finished or something. This is actually replated. This is the original shifter the car started life with. 45 year old shifter. They redid the chrome on it. This is a replicas of the original wood grain shift pattern that goes in the top. The original number two countersunk Phillips screws. And again, the beautiful Hearst writing original. This is absolutely the top quality stuff in the nation. The Chrysler assembly plant, the way that they did things. If you did not have a reference as to whether the bolt goes forward or goes backwards, the rule of thumb, the general rule of thumb was the car going down the road like that, everything would impale from the front. You want to start at a car and go from the front to the back. That's not to say you couldn't turn this right around and go the other direction. They'll work both ways, but one way is correct. Any 3 8 bolt long enough to go through this cross member will hold it. I guarantee you that's the truth. The correct original one looks like this. It has three stampings on it, and in the middle is the TR, the washer. This is twice as thick as the average washer, and you see it has an original type of metal finish on it. The end is a self-guider. This is the correct bolt to hold the transmission cross member in place. This is the original crush style nut. Today, they put nylon in these nuts and that nylon holds it from being able to back off. Back in these days, they put a swedge on these nuts. That's why on this side, it's an oval hole. On this side, it's a perfectly round hole. If the car's not in neutral, I can't get an, a neutral gate on my shifter. You know how when you get in a car and you want to find out if you're in neutral, you slap it back and forth like that, and that, that's the neutral gate. If you look up at this shifter and you see this little pin right here, this white pin holds the shift levers in the neutral position. I know right now that that shifter, even though I'm not up in the car shaking it from side to side, is in neutral. I need to make sure the transmission is in neutral. That's how you line up the four-speed linkage. You can't have it in first gear and try to line it up. It's not going to work. You see how my shaft is moving up there? I would not be able to do that if this car was in gear. This is our 3-4 shift rod right here at the front of the transmission. This is the 1-2 selector. So the 3-4 goes from the outside, the driver's side, pointing that way. Because that doesn't like to go like that. Nope, I want to figure this out on camera and so I look like an idiot. Why don't you go, no? Not gonna do that. That's not gonna need to happen here. Get it out of the way so I can move around without feeling claustrophobic. 
Why are you? These aren't helping, so I don't know why I'm wearing them. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. My and call me Charlie. We know this is our three, four. It has to go there. That's our one, two. It has to go there. What am I doing backwards here? Okay, I figured out my problem. These things can go a multitude of ways, but they only fall on and really fit one way. So even, even the old salty dog needs a little bit of refresher course. Dropping on like that, I like that. Let me get my glasses and a light. I'm a piece of Everything's in. Uh, I still have to hook up the reverse lockout linkage, which I'll do here shortly. But basically how it works now is this is our pistol grip shifter. We're very familiar with it. This thing's in position. You pull it. It's going to pull this lever back. That's going to be first gear. When it goes forward, it's going to be second gear. Then you're going to come back to the neutral gate. Then you're going to click over to the right a little bit and go forward. That's going to draw this arm back, this arm, excuse me, back, and then this arm forward. That's going to be third and fourth gear. Go all the way over like the pattern says to the left, up. It's going to drag this arm back, and it's going to clunk that mother into reverse like that. And that's your four speed. After finally getting the linkage adjusted in our six pack Challenger, I can get back to the tasks that have to be done this week. We've got to get Goldberg's car completely disassembled, the body and paint work done in the trunk, and then back over to the assembly shop so we can get it put together. Will is ready to do the pre-paint on the 1967 Hemi GTX convertible, which is way overdue. I need to do the body work and the block and the paint on the deck lid for the 76 pack Challenger. And at the end of the week, I'm gonna take Will Silver Spoon Scott back to school. I'm gonna teach him how to paint the old fashioned way in the heart. You can't give nobody your heart. That's what they said to Rocky. You know, so, well, Adrian said that to Rocky in, I think in Rocky three and then Rocky five. But he probably forgot it. I mean, he's had the hell beat out of his head. They're coming to get you, Barbara. We've got our 1968 Plymouth GTX convertible rolled around and into the assembly shop now. Uh, if you recall, this car belongs to Bill Goldberg, a famous wrestler. Uh, he brought it to us as a painted car, all of the components detailed and ready to install. He just asked that we install it and put the car back together again. Basically what happened was Bill kind of ran out of time. He's got a busy schedule with all the things that he does. And so he asked us to assemble the car. Now to date, what he's done is he's rebuilt the engine, but it needs to be detailed. So it's all together, it's under the hood, it's in the car, but it's not detailed correctly. So all of the peripheral pieces, such as the distributor, the spark plug wires, the exhaust manifolds, all the painting, all the detailing, all the brackets, that all needs to be built out and plumbed out. Uh, the clutch and flywheel are not installed. Everything's just kind of mocked in place for the travel up here. They are rebuilt and they need to be assembled, but they're not put together yet. He rebuilt the rear end himself and it's installed. It looks good. I don't think we'll have to take it back out again. Uh, the body and paint's beautiful on it. The shop that did the work before did a phenomenal job. There's a couple of chips on it that we do need to do some touch up when we're all done. But body and paint wise, that's about it. The interior has been completely restored and ready to be reassembled. The only problems are the dash was done wrong. So if you look at the dash itself, you'll see that the VIN number was painted over with the same blue that the rest of the dash is. Two problems. One, the blue's too shiny. It's supposed to be a matte finish because imagine driving down the road with a glossy dash. It's going to reflect light. It's dangerous. So the manufacturer put a matte or a satin finish in there. Two is that VIN plate isn't supposed to be painted blue. It's supposed to be the original black with the white letters that say uh, Chrysler Corporation on it. So we're gonna redetail that. The dash has already been rebuilt by Bill or whomever it is that he had to do it down south. We just wanna go over everything and make sure, do a bench test, make sure all the gauges are working, make sure everything's ready to go together. Right now it's just kinda setting in the car. So we gotta go through and make sure that it's actually ready to be officially in the car so that the car can be driven when we're finished. Bill's invested thousands of dollars in the chrome and the bright work. Uh, he's entrusted it to us. It's kind of interesting. Uh, he put a note here, it wasn't for me, but he actually wrote on the rocker moldings. So. I'm not nervous holding the, the molding. I'm worried about that word right there and that something could happen to me if something happened to the molding. So I'm just gonna be really sure that I protect this molding at all costs because you only have one of these. So I got Torino's 1967 GTX convertible in the booth right now. I got the whole car seam sealed, 
on the floorboards and I, now I'm getting ready to seal it and start putting my color down. I'll put three or four coats of color on it, two coats of clear, get the whole outside of it painted. Then we're going to assemble the car. I've already finished the doors and the fenders, the hood and the deck lid. So this will go back to the body man as soon as I'm done. He'll assemble the whole car. We'll clean up any areas that might need a dressing and then we'll block it down again and it'll be ready for final paint. Mark likes to paint everything twice. I'm not a huge fan of pre-painting, but it's not bad for the car. Paint, primer, it all shrinks as time goes on. So one nice thing is, is when I paint this car with the pre-paint, the car is gonna go outside, it's gonna sit for a little while, so it'll shrink. So that way when I do the final block on it, it just comes out great and there is no shrink back. Since I've been here, Mark's always done it this way. He insists on sticking with it. It's important to do a good mass job. You know, painting it's actually the easy part to come in here and paint it. If your prep works really nice, then the paint job will come out nice. We're getting ready to remove the engine, transmission, K-member, and rear suspension for our 68 GTX. There's some build out that still needs to be done on the drivetrain, as well as some corrective detailing. So like the sway bar is supposed to be natural, the uh, strut rods are supposed to be natural. Instead, they have kind of a hammerite finish on them. K-member looks great. The nuts that hold the strut rods on look right. Brake drums are correct. They're supposed to be a black, but they're supposed to be like a black phosphate. Lower control arms are the biggest point right here. These are supposed to be a natural finish. Remember, originally they were bare metal and they dipped them in Cosmoline out to the ball joint. Torsion bars are right, but we got to take all that out to be able to get the K-member out. Once the drivetrain's out of the car, we're going to take the engine off of the K-member and we'll build out the engine for it and get it painted in detail. The other thing is, if you look at the paint that's on it, it's a real flat finish. It's supposed to be a satin finish, and the way we achieve that is with a single stage acrylic urethane with a slight flattening agent in it. So we'll end up repainting this after we put it together as well. And the leaf springs, depending what year it is and where it was made, are either a natural finish or like an iron finish, a black uh, phosphate type of a look, so like a flat black. Uh, so that them being gray like that isn't right. But the shocks are right, the hose, the flex line's right, the brake lines are right, the plumbing just needs to be done correctly under here. So really all we're talking about doing is dropping the drivetrain out, going through, detailing up the things that have been done that need to be done a little bit differently, and then putting the engine together and getting it painted, detailed, and ready to go back in the car. Lower it down, take the wheels off. <laughs> they put the lug nuts on the left-hand side of the car with a reverse thread, a left-hand thread. So see, it looks like I'm taking it off, but it's actually walking on right now. They realized in 71 that didn't make any sense. They changed it to the standard right-hand thread. Mike, you just wanted to rip that core support off the car. He just yeah. loved it. Is anything tore up? It just, is why it wouldn't you just let us take the torsion bars out like we always have it's for 57 out. years? I don't, want, I don't want to hear it. They just Ooh. don't get along with anybody. That's the problem. No. The drive train came out with absolutely no problem at all. We expected that. Um, it hasn't been that long since it was bolted in there. Everything's fresh. Now that we've got the drivetrain out, we just need to finish the assembly of the engine, then detail it out, build it out. There's some corrections that need to be made to the K-member front suspension, as well as a little bit of changes to the rear suspension. While we're waiting for that drivetrain to be built out, we're gonna go ahead and move the car into the assembly shop so we can lay everything out, start inventorying our parts, and get ready to put that car together. What differentiated the appearance of the 1967 Plymouth GTX from the standard Belvedere? Was it increased wheelbase and tire size, custom hood scoops and racing stripes, mandatory wheel skirts and body side moldings? The answer coming up after the break. The unburied dead are coming back to life. So what did differentiate the appearance between the 67 Plymouth GTX and the standard Belvedere? The answer is B. The GTX was built on the Belvedere platform. 
Therefore, in essence, it looked like a Belvedere, but when they added the hood scoops, the racing stripes on the hood and on the deck lid, amongst changes to the taillights and grill, it made a considerable difference in appearance over the original standard Plymouth Belvedere. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. So what I'm getting ready to do is the body work on our 1970 Dodge Challenger deck lid. Uh, just a quick backstory. This was actually already painted several times. Uh, if you look at the back side of it, you'll see this jammed purple, the original FC7. So what happened basically was the body man did his body work. He felt the panel. He says, oh, there's a dent there. There's a dent there. It was still lumpy, but he either couldn't feel it or didn't care and loaded it with primer, epoxy primer. Just buried it, flooded it with it. Now, primer can go so thick, but if you go too thick, it'll split out in time. So it should have been flattened out with the filler. Filler's designed to be built up to a certain millage and not crack or fail. So instead of doing that, they did some filler and loaded it with primer. In his mind, it felt good, so he went ahead and sealed it and painted it. It just doesn't work. You end up chasing your tail. By the time we were done with this, by the time we stripped this chemically, there were at least four paint jobs on it and at least four primer jobs, plus the sealers and the base coats in between them. So you have to start with a clean piece of metal. That's what you see here. We chemically stripped the deck lid. After chemically stripping it, we cleaned it up with an eight inch sanding pad. This is where you should start every single time with your body work. This thing's kind of lumpy all over. It's got some problems pretty much from one end to the other. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do one half of the deck lid. I'm not gonna do the whole thing at once because remember, I wanna sand it while it's soft. You can get overwhelmed. I've seen guys just start smearing filler all over the car. You start sanding it, it gets hard, and you're tired and you wanna go home. You kinda get a feel for how much filler you're gonna need. So there's my filler setting out like that. This is your hardener. This is what catalyzes the filler. I'm gonna put this first one on. Start to get a feel for how it lays on there. I can kind of tell by the way it's filling in and not filling in where my low spots are gonna be at. So the filler's at a point right now where it's ready to sand or very, very close to ready to sand. You know, block and filler's just like block and primer. If you don't, if you don't take time to learn what you're watching for, it can get away from you and you can just create more and more problems. That's what the other guy did. So we're just gonna let that sandpaper do the cutting. We're gonna keep working it. You'll notice right now, this is your dust. This is what happens when you cut it soft. It's nothing. It's not filling the, the shop with clouds of dust and garbage. It's just a really nice way to do your filler. Okay, everything feels great. So I got the GTX all masked, ready for paint. I'm gonna go in there first and get the doors all jammed, and then we can hang them on the car and do the final paint. Yeah, Mark is, Mark's a silly guy. All the hand signals, uh, I don't know what all that's about. My job as an owner around here is to make sure that the other guys are doing their job. Will's no exception. Uh, I feel the need to go in and check on him when he's painting on something. I think every once in a while it's just not a bad idea to remind him, you know, who the big cat on campus is. You know what I'm saying? The big dog. So this big dog's running around spraying everything. You know what I'm saying? Spraying in the booth. Not, I know what you're saying about mm. Okay. So anywhere, I know you already know, but anywhere you've got bare metal, I want you to go over that with etch before right. you seal it. And then you're gonna do two sealers, two coats of one. Mark keeps coming out quite a bit these days, kind of explaining everything that needs to be done. Um, I've been doing this a long time, so I'm not sure if he's just feeling insecure that I'm doing a better job than he is, or if he's just actually coming out to check on the quality of the work. To the top of this, this from that perimeter up, all goes black and then this goes blue down here. Right. And I don't know if you thought about it, but it'd probably be easier to mask the blue off. That's what I was gonna do. So gonna do the blue first? Yeah. As a mentor, my job's not just to, to hand somebody a, a paint gun and say, go do it. To nurture, to protect them. Okay, all right, go ahead.
Oh. I'm Samson fighting Goliath every day. All right. They're, uh, they're little versions of me. They're like little Samsonites, and uh, not the luggage. And they're fighting big things like Goliath, but not as big as Goliath. What are you doing? If you don't push them to perform, then they're not going to perform. And so they need to know the big dog's watching. They need to know Big Brother's got the camera up in the corner and it's framed right on them. I'm the great interrogator. Um, I'm not sure if Mark needs coffee or if he's had a few too many. A lot more work would be getting done if he'd just stay up there in the office. Now that I have delivered the necessary lessons to my pupils, I can get back to my job, which is the deck lid for the 1970 Dodge Challenger. So I sealed the doors. That takes about 10 minutes to really dry. I lay the blue down first, because it's a smaller area to mask off. Give that about 30 minutes so it's nice and dry so I can tape on it. Tape off all the blue. I'm gonna lay the black down. Then right after I lay the black down, I can unmask it. Then that's where you'll have your two-tone. And then I'll give that about 10 minutes, then I go in there and put uh, two coats of clear on it, and it's done. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened. The unburied dead are coming back to life. I'm working on the Hemi GTX right now, uh, the dark blue one. So now that I got the doors completely painted and hung on the car, the car is all masked up and it's ready for its final paint now. It's good to get a uh, good foundation laid down first, so that way when the final paint's applied, it's like a sheet of glass. Even though I know what I'm doing, I've been doing it a long time, and why Mark keeps peeking around the window like a little, little mouse, little bird in your pocket, I don't know what he's trying to accomplish, but I'm doing just fine on my own. So right now I'm getting ready to go in and put my first coat of color on. So once I got the pre-paint completely done, I'll let it cure out real good. I'll sand it, block it, uh, prep it, and get it ready for the, uh, the final paint job. This station will remain on the air, day and night. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. So what I'm getting ready to do is the body work on our 1970 Dodge Challenger deck lid. Now I've got all the basic filler work done on this. So that's the plastic filler that you're gonna use to to smooth out the low areas of it. And as you can see, it's very, very thin. You can see it taper into it, just feathering very slightly, small low spot here, small overall low spots here and here, small low spot, low spot, low spot, low spot. And that's just the stamping of the metal. But that's the steps you have to take to make sure that it's straight. Now what I gotta do is get rid of my 36, 40, and 80 grit scratches and put an overall film on this. So what I'm gonna use is a metal glaze so I don't have primer trying to fill those scratches. So we're gonna mix that up now. I got a bigger piece of cardboard out because this stuff goes absolutely everywhere. Like I say, it likes to move around, run, pour off the panels, anything it can do. This stuff dries really fast, so you gotta be careful with the amount of hardener that you put in it. And again, this goes on super thin. It'll look in the beginning like I'm putting it on thick, but I keep thinning it out until I have the right concentration from one end to the other of filler. So let's go do it. You see how that spreads out a lot faster? This, because you have to let it dry thoroughly before you sand on it, I like to just do both halves at the same time. So basically where we're at right now is the glaze coat has had a chance to completely dry out. And so I'm gonna uh, start sanding it with a fresh piece of 80 grit, again, the cross blocking. And if I can get this to finish off just the way I'm hoping that it will, it'll be ready to do some final metal cleanup and primer. Okay, so now all of the uh, polyester filler or the glaze is, is sanded out, feathered out, and I have a nice flat surface. I don't have any deviations in it that I can feel, but that's it there. Okay, so we're gonna blow it off. Okay, so I just mixed myself up a little DP90. This is designed to go directly over the top of bare metal, and it'll also seal the filler. Once I've done that, I can go right over the top of that with my actual primer filler. 
is our K38. Okay. So I just put my fourth coat of urethane primer on there. That should be enough to fill in any of the uh, uh, sand scratches that are left. I can already see it's bridging them really nicely. Right now we're getting ready to do one of the last steps as far as cosmetic repair to Bill Goldberg's 1968 GTX, and that is the painting of the trunk compartment. Will's getting ready to do the sound deadener on the sides of the quarters, which should have been done at the time the original body and paint was done. Uh, but we can clean it up now, and you'll never know we'll never know uh, that it wasn't done when it was supposed to be. You got the pattern from? Uh, the 68 yellow GTX against the fence back there. So this is an original 68 GTX. This is a one-owner car. The guy's dad bought it brand new. We're getting ready to restore it this fall. Here you can see on the inside of the quarter panels the original sound deadener. It starts right here goes across this middle section. You can see the ridge over here where it ends. What the sound deadener was intended to do was take some of the tinniness out of the cars from the factory. That's a lot of tin. That's a lot of steel that's just going to resonate when you're driving down the road. That sound deadener will help that. There's some on the insides of the door, some on the insides of the quarters. Then they use a different type of product on the floor. We try to emulate that look. Interesting point here. Look at how the factory did the seam sealer. It was a machine that they ran through there. Look at the size of that blob of seam sealer between the quarter and the outer wheelhouse right here. Just before we get going, I want to refresh my memory. This is a Plymouth, it's a B body, and it's a 68. So real quick, before we spray out the product, I want to go out to the graveyard, take a look at a couple original examples, get an idea exactly where that pattern goes. This is a 68 Charger. This is our Slant 6 car. Very original car. Here, the sound deadener is just insane. They've came all the way back here. This is more like an E body. They put this aftermarket sealer over the top of it, but you can see where it ends back there near the side marker opening. That's a lot wider on the Charger in 68 than it was on the GTX. Ends here, starts all the way up there at the inside of the quarter panel. So this sound deadener was put on the car before the quarter was welded on at the factory. 69 Charger, this one's even different a little bit than the 68, but not a lot. You can see the footprint of the original stuff. So there's your 69 B body. This is our famous 1970 Dodge Challenger 440 four-speed car that we're fixing up. This is the one that uh, Darren used to own that my client bought. Here you can see we emulated the original sound deadener exactly like a Challenger would be on both sides and got a little more careless with the seam sealer. This is something I did about 10 years ago. Try to help him out, try to motivate him, try to get him to work on the car, but nope, he ain't working on nothing. I'm Darren, no. 69B body Super B, very similar to the GTX, a little bit different body style because Plymouth and Dodge, Dodge is always a little bit bigger than the Plymouth. Here you got it ending here, but going all the way forward. 71 Challenger, very much like the 70 Challenger of Darren's old car. You see it stops and has a big wide swatch around the opening of the side marker, and then goes forward. That means the fact that it went forward had to be put on before the quarter panel was installed. That's the way the factory did the sound deadening material on the insides of the quarter panels. And you got your gun, and you got the correct sprayable. Yep. And you're ready to go. Correct. This is where the magic happens. So we just got finished putting the sound deadener on the quarter panels of the GTX. It didn't use a lot in the way of a footprint. There's two swatches down each side. Will had a little bit of trouble, you know, trying to lay it out. I mean, he, he's a good painter, but it takes time to, to kind of massage things around where they're working for you, you know, uh, meaning that, the, like I say, just really excellent work, and I'm honored to be working with him. Thank you. That means a lot. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. True or false, when originally introduced, the Plymouth GTX was called the businessman's coach. 
The answer coming up after the break. So was the Plymouth GTX in 1967 originally referred to as the businessman's coach? The answer is false. Plymouth actually dubbed it the gentleman's muscle car. It had a 440 cubic inch, 375 horsepower engine standard with the optional 426 Emmy, yet it had options available to it such as power windows, the automatic transmission, it had dress up kits on the outside. These cars looked more like a luxury car than they did a muscle car. Hence the reason they were called the gentleman's muscle car. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Just let me know when it, let me know when it comes in if you can, hang on sir. Hey, we're at a standstill. Can you go down and grab us eight of these? Oh, God. Currently, I'm waiting for Will to finish up in the paint booth. Uh, I've got the 400 Magnum and the 426 Hemi ready to paint, and I would personally like to paint those engines. Sure. Is that all? Anything else I can do for you? Uh, no, I think I'll do it. Okay, you ready? 5480. Hey, D. Hey boss, 0610. Today's Murphy's Law Day, all right? The day I got things that I need to get done that I only have time to do, I'm getting bombarded by every human being that works here. That's it. Awesome, thanks yeah. sir. You the man. Yep, no, the Great Eclipse is back. Yes, Mike, I sorry. I need uh, 24 feet of chain also. You know, in, in a perfect world, and I, and I know this sounds egomaniacal, I'd love to have another version of me, a clone. It's like in that episode of The Office towards the end when Ricky Gervais and Steve Carell hook up walking out of the elevator. <laughs> they're, they're peas in a pod. I'm not saying I'm Ricky Gervais, but I mean, obviously, if I wanted to be, so. Six zero, okay, let's start over. Five, four, eight, zero. Hey, boss. Hey, you know what the paint code is on that dashboard on that 68 GTX? This is stupid. Think of all of your questions at one time and then come see me, right? You don't go to the drive-up window at the local choke computer and say, give me a hamburger, and then go around it one more time and say, now I'll have some french fries, and then around again, and give me a Coke with that. The dash is a different color than the rest of the car. I yeah. asked Bill, I didn't, he didn't give me the fender tag when okay. he dropped the car off, so I asked him to send me a copy of it, and I haven't got it yet. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, now I'm gonna try to order some more parts. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Hey, do you care if we, uh... I don't mind. Oh, gosh, what's that about? Do you care if we use a tow truck for a couple hours? You know, this may be the actual day I kill somebody. Talking to, your, to, talking to your dad. For what, for what, what? To, to move some stuff for Alyssa. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. Help her right. move. Yep, he said no problem. Okay. He yeah. said it's his pleasure. I want diesel put in it. All right, and he wants some fuel put in it. I want, I want as much as you're using. No, nothing, he was just being dumb. I'm talking about the kind of stuff that, you know, investigation and discovery. You just start putting body parts in mailboxes all over town. You know, you've got mail. <laughs> you know. What's up, Manson? <laughs> Hey boss, you remembered. Yeah, did uh, Garza uh, seat upholstery come in yet? Seat covers, uh, do you know? All the seat kit, yes, they're here. They're upstairs in the parts room, way back by Miss, by uh, Tony's parts, tucked in the corner. Okay, they're cool. all here, yep. Thank you. Yep. Something uh, figured out if you would've went up there and looked. So right now I've got the whole car all long blocked in 320. Mark and I last night fitted the doors, the fenders, got everything aligned properly. So we're doing the final block on it now, scuffing, up the, scuffing out the jams. And then when I take it outside to wash it and get all the dust off it and whatnot, that's when I'll do my wet sand with 600. And then it'll be ready for color. I'll have it back over to Dave and assembly uh, within the next two weeks, fully painted and cut and buff, ready for him to put together. The car came here just to get freshened up on the body and paint and that was it. So the assembly should go real fast. Uh, Emma Marie Rose, you're next. Emma, Emma Marie, oh yes. Hello there. How may I assist you, young lady? You want um, the pink. Oh, your fingernails? Mm-hmm. And I want to leave these ones on and I just want the pink on this one. Paint all of them. Because you want they... me to paint them for you? I could probably do that. Do you have paint? Oh, look at you go. You are ready for grandpa. I like it. Okay. So right now, I'm working on the 67 convertible GTX. I'm getting ready to go in and start putting my color down. The color's actually dark blue. So when I go in there, I'll get about six coats of the color on it, and then finish it with three coats of clear, and then it'll uh, be good to go. <laughs> okay, FM3 Panther Pink Moulin Rouge. This is Minnie Mouse paint. Okay, 
Oh my goodness, let's try it here. Let's, all right, let's see what we can do. Oh goodness, those are little fingers. Now I can paint a car. You'd think if grandpa could paint a car, he probably could paint a fingernail. Let's give it a shot. I used to paint model cars when I was a little boy. I built one called the school bus, and it was a school bus, but it had two Hemis in it. Two 426 Hemis that were blown with 671 blowers. They ran nitromethane. Nitromethane. Very good, you see? Sure, it's not the best, it's not the greatest. I never said I was the greatest fingernail painter in the world. Let's blow on those for a second. They kind of turn in red a little bit. I, I'm not sure they're FM3 Panther Pink Moulin Rouge, which only 2% of all Chrysler muscle cars were painted that color. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very rare color. Why don't you go show your mama and your grandma? Grandma, look. So right now I've got six coats of color on it. I'm giving it about 15 minutes to finish drying. Then I'm gonna go in there, put three coats of clear on, and I'm done. So I'll have the uh, GTX wrapped up paint-wise today. I'll get it cut and buffed and over to assembly next week, and then I can jump back on the 71 tribute car that we have. He did oh, a good job. So don't touch it, Mommy. Don't touch oh, it. Right. Yeah, you don't get a lot of opportunities to hang out with the grandkids, so when you do, you... Hey, Mommy, good job, high five. I'm gonna have to call somebody and tell them that I hate their guts, so I don't wanna lose this moment because I know this is a very precious. Where's the filler panel for the charger? I told you I needed that a week ago, you freak. First eyewitness accounts of this grisly development came from people who were understandably frightened. The unburied dead are coming back to life. All right, boss, I got the booth all cleared out for you. Awesome. Oh, good. Why do you want it cleared out? Because we need to paint the 426 Hemi and the uh, 400 Magnum for the 72 for Goodings. Do you so. want me to just do them both real quick? No, I'm not. I'm gonna do them. I just... I'm sorry? I'm gonna do them myself. What do you mean? Well, because I saw a couple of little... little faux pas, we call them, on the challenge. I just thought uh, I want to make sure I get paint. One of the goals was to get paint all on the engine. Right, and that's what you weren't doing, and that's why you hired me to come back. Anytime that you think that you're good enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the kid, the ice man, ice tray they call me, the frozen cube, feel free to get, jump in, you know? You're kidding, right? You wanna take on the kid? Is that you're what serious. this is? You're laying a gauntlet down, you wanna take on the kid? You wanna take the ice man on, the ice tray? The young guy on the campus, you know, is always looking to knock the quarterback off the off the team, and so, you wanna take me on? You wanna you're go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the kid? Anytime. We're gonna go out there, I guess, and do some paint off top gun thing. I don't know what that means yet. We go out there to paint the engine. I think what you're gonna end up doing is going back to school.
Can we just stop the silliness and just go get this done? This is our DP. Choke. <laughs> 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 Who the f doesn't put the lid back on? You gotta kill somebody. You're reckless. Okay. We're getting ready to put our epoxy primer on. This is something that'll bite right into the, the metal on the block, because those blocks are bare metal. Anyway, no, Will's kind of nervous right now. No. Will's a little... Nope. Can I talk? Nope. Will's a little upset at the situation right now. He's getting ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Iceman. Let's gun it. You want to turn the booth on? Let's or? do it. He'd kill somebody in a Top Gun competition, all right? He's dangerous. He's not like me. I'm very careful. We're not flying. We're... So the first hop went pretty well. Um, he missed a few spots uh, on his doing the epoxy, but that's one of the things that the no, younger No, actually, did. I got all mine. You were getting ready to call. He was done, so I jumped over there, got his wrapped up. No, I then saw after you start I was done wrapping his up, I came back over to finish mine. He was pulling his mask off. You never pull because your I mask was, off before you, you land. You were in there talking with it okay. all. Epoxy on everything. Right, and I see where you missed it all over yours. Not at all, fine. Well, that's what I'm getting right here. Looking good on my No word. No, nowhere near. I think we come to the conclusion, I kind of outpainted you on the epoxy. No, you didn't. That's one I up for- I got mine done, and then I fixed yours, and then went back to mine. So technically, I'm up by two. Okay. It's I time for somebody to go to yes. school. Okay, getting ready to mix up some colors. I gave him the real easy one that covers really well. No, nope, you gave me the dog one. Okay. See, anybody can hold a paint gun, okay? It's about looking cool when you're doing there it. There isn't one thing about looking cool that you're doing right now. Okay. As I get ready to give Will a lesson in painting Engine Blocks 101, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to reflect as well uh, just how blessed we've been at Graveyard Cars and what a great week we've had. We got all the paint and the body and the cosmetic work on Mr. Bill Goldberg's 1968 GTX convertible. It is now ready to come back over to the assembly shop and get put together. I got all the body work done and the primer on our deck lid for our 70 Challenger. Will did a great job painting the 1967 Hemi GTX convertible for Mr. Torino. Um, and probably the most rewarding part will be here very shortly as I walk around with a Top Gun trophy, you know, just like in the movie, right? So the, the list for the alternates is in the ladies' room. It's a classical reference right there, back to Top Gun. So I had a good week this week. I got the uh, GTX all painted, getting ready to roll it over to the area before I start the cutting and buffing. That's going to take two or three days to get that all done, and then I'll get it over to Mark for assembly. <laughs> I How said, what he's doing right that now? knee look bad. I mean, every time I can What he's doing right now is he's kind of upset over the, the whooping. What it? Next time on Graveyard Cars, Mark teaches Alyssa to document and prep three cars for disassembly. The team installs the 400 Magnum and the 1972 Dodge Charger, and Alyssa commits a crime that Mark may never forgive. Coming up on the next episode of Graveyard Cars.